Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. We're here for episode 500 and my New Year's Eve episode. As you can see, balling out on champagne. So, um, not, not to do too much uh, uh, reflecting, but this year has been outstanding. Uh, I say that word a lot, <clears throat> um, but this, this year has been outstanding. I don't think I thought... I don't think I knew exactly what this year was going to bring. I'm not going to do a recap in this episode. I'm actually going to plan on recording a recap episode and a what the future holds episode. Uh, one episode for both. Um, it might be the next episode. I kind of recorded a recap of Oregon, of the places I didn't that I didn't get interviews at, but I visited. I either had official tasting appointments or I went to the tasting room and kind of like came give you like a day by day what I did real brief. I recorded two of those episodes because it was 12 days. I might re-record them. I'm not sure yet. I actually haven't watched those episodes. So those originally were gonna be episodes 501, 502. They might be 502, 503. Haven't figured that out yet. Um, but I'm probably gonna do like a little like recap of the year and all that kind of stuff. I'm not gonna do that now. But all I have to say is um, a lot of stuff's gone on. Uh, just professionally, personally, um, with this podcast, and um, I'm kind of feel like I should be celebrating. It's 500 episodes. Uh, I don't think I ever thought I was going to be at 500 episodes. I celebrated the 10th anniversary this year back in May with episode 450. So I thought let's let's do something special for episode 500 instead of just you know okay well I'll just pull whatever I have at home which I got some other champagne and sparkling wines that are some cool stuff. But let's, let's do this. So I, I, I did spend some money. I spent a lot of money. So with that said, if you go to my website, you want to help me out cover the cost of these. You don't have to. If you want to help cover the cost, there's a PayPal button. You have to go to the website. It's not on, it's not on YouTube or on the podcast. Go to the website, throw me a couple ducats. So I might as well hit you up for the money now. Uh, anyway, because... Uh, not making any money on YouTube yet. Now, if you get all your friends to subscribe on YouTube and I get to a thousand subscribers and I go back into um, profit, not profit, you know, the revenue thing, but I still have never been paid by Google, just so you know. I haven't earned that much. All right, so let's get into this episode. I, I just cannot wait. All right, so <clears throat> I decided to go with basically at least Two of them are Tet Cuvées. The third one's not because the third one's Tet to Cuvée. To Cuvée. It's pretty pricey. So, but I went with like quality anyway. All right, so this first one. Now, when I went to um, Provine, this was actually the first time I was ever, I was ever able to taste Palme d'Or. So this is the 2002 uh, Nicholas Fuyat uh, Palme d'Or. Um, bought at Total Wine believe it or not, for only $109.97, so $110 for a Tete de Gouvet. But, I mean, that's kind of the price for it. And um, Wine Spectator uh, rated this vintage as the best since 1996. Now, granted, it was only six years prior, but this was a... The O2 vintage uh, was considered a really good vintage. Now, 06, 08 came along... Uh, they, they're, they're excellent vintages. So, uh, they came along. I might say they're better in 02. 02 kind of ranks up, ranks up there with them. Uh, 08 is going to kind of, kind of was overshadowing 09. We're going to have an 09 here in a little, in a little bit, but, um, anyway, so Lincoln's Fiat's somewhat of a newer house. Um, 
It was founded in 1976 by Nicholas Fiat and Henri Macart. Uh, it started out as, a, as an equivalent to like a custom crush facility for uh, like other champagne houses or other people that were gonna make champagne. Uh, but then it became its own house later. Um, since that point, it has become the number one selling brand in France uh, and the number three selling brand in the world. Now I've had their, their regular Nicholas Fiat, I've had their Rosé, they're both outstanding they're excellent, excellent um, wines. Uh, at Provine, I had the Palme d'Or, the first time I ever had it. So uh, I'm gonna have it again, but different vintage. I'm pretty sure the vintage that they had there was whatever the current release was. I put all the champagnes in the fridge. They were in there for about a good, I don't know, 45 minutes, almost an hour. The, the Dom wasn't because I pulled a different champagne out by accident. So the Dom's only been there for about 40 minutes. But let's get into it. And I mean, this, it's a, such a distinctive bottle. It's really cool. All right. By the way, Psalm Groups will be drinking really good on Monday. Of course, by the time you saw this, that already happened. Because uh, it's um, December the 7th right now. Uh, and I, I'm hosting Psalm Group on the 9th. Oh, by the way... Um, by the time you've seen this, hopefully I will know, but uh, on December 10th, I took my uh, advanced sommelier assessment exam. That's the exam, the test to see if you actually can take the actual test. So I'm hoping that uh, everything went well with that one. I've definitely been studying probably more than I normally do. Uh, but yeah, so let's get into this. 2002, man. Still plenty of bubbles. So just classic champagne going on here. Um, really just more of the more of the bakery pastry brioche going on here. A touch of green apple. A touch of strawberry. By the way, the uh, Tete de Cuvée is also called the Prestige Cuvée. Just they're, they're interchangeable in case you were wondering. And what that means is that it's officially the top bottling of that champagne house. Now, some champagne houses have special bottlings. And we're not talking special club, that's a different thing. They'll have special bottlings that sometimes are more expensive than the Tete de Cuvée. But and I'll get to that in a second here. Not a second, I'll get to this on the next wine. It just smells great. It's 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 all that bakery type of stuff in the brioche and the and the lazy quality and just a little bit of of that apple and strawberry. It's really nice. It's a touch oxidative, um, but it it should be. It's seventeen years old, so. Yeah, I, the spit buckets over there. I'm gonna drink these. I mean, I'm celebrating 500 episodes. Screw that. I'm, I'm, and I'm not going anywhere. So anyway, wow. If I'm starting off with this, I can only imagine what these are gonna be just like. So the aroma, the the, the nose is just kind of taken to another level on the palate. There's there's even more of a richness to it. Um, it's not sweet. But there's this, there's this fruitiness to it. Um, it's more of a golden apple rather than just like apple, like just generic apple. It's more of a golden apple. Um, you know, I didn't get this. I didn't uh, see what the. I didn't look up to see what the um, uh, blend on this necessarily. But I know it's a Chard Pinot blend. Um, and while I'm talking, I'm gonna uh, try to find that real quick because I was just studying all my fun stuff for when I went this exam to take the exam. So, uh, and I should have the Tetu Gueves all listed so I can see what's going on there. Boom, knowledge prep. And let's throw out champagne. All right, so anyway, while, while that loads up, 
yeah, I just... Mm. So it's a 50-50 blend of um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Let's see here. Since I since I pulled it out, <clears throat> yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Anyway, um, it's super delicious. There's a little bit of caramel to it. That was the one thing I was wanted to talk about. It was a little bit of caramel apple, um, but it's more of a kind of a cross between golden and green apple. Um, a richness to it. Um, a little oxidative, but it should be. So you can, it tastes like it's got a little bit of age to it. The golden color is it's getting more gold. Um, <clears throat> it's got a little bit of green to it, which I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, which I, which I expect. Chardonnay tends to throw a little green occasionally, but it's it's getting kind of golden, honestly, from the oxidation. It just smells luxurious. I probably poured a little too much because I really should move on to the next wine, but it, I don't really want to throw up this particular word yet because this is only the first of the three champagnes. And, you know, champagne number two, I think I've only had once or twice too. I know I have not had this vintage. The last champagne I've had like once, not this version of it, um, but I've had it like once. In fact, I need to make sure I get my phone here because there's something I need to use for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, sublime kind of comes to mind, but <clears throat> I have a feeling that all three of these, I could use that word. I said, it's not sweet. You know, there's probably, it's brute. At least it's, I think it says brute on here. It's brute. So that means it could be anywhere from zero to 12 grams per liter of sugar. Um, so... That just is just balancing out the acid. It, it feels balanced. It's not super acidic, but I, I, you know, the mouth's watering, so you know there's acid there. It's there, but it's not. It's not like sweet, but there's a fruit quality to it. There's a fruitiness to it. Caramel apple, brioche, ye, kind of yeasty. Almost, almost, you know, like almost like a, you know, it's it's a little bit like a Belgian triple ale. The, the there's not sweet but that full of flavor uh and that type of richness to it with some toastiness yeah a little bit of toastiness like a english muffin toasted or more more like a croissant a croissant a croissant that maybe heated up a little bit so you get the little caramelization. Uh, was it the, um, um, oh man, I forgot what, what, what that word is called, but it's, there's a word that's talking about browning, you know, when the sugar's caramelized. Or, um, it's not paillard. Um, I forgot what it's called, but anyway, maybe if I, I'll, I'll put in the lower third what it is. Ma Maillard, Maillard um, process or whatever it is. It's delicious. Oh my God, super good. All right, so let's move on to the next one because we don't want these to warm up too much because we don't want the repeat of uh, Christmas. Um, anyway, so next one, this is the 2009 uh, Moet and Ed Chandon. It is Moet, not Moet, because um, they're actually, I think, a Dutch family. Um, 2009 Dom Perignon. So why 09? Well, because I started in 09. So I really want an 09 vintage this whole thing started because I wanted something from 09. Now, 09 is not like a vintage that gets a lot of press. Um, I don't think a lot of champagne houses actually have released their 09s. Um, some of them have, some of them haven't. Actually, the current, what, what I've seen currently on the market for the Dom is 08. Uh, the 09 was out before the 08, which does happen occasionally that they'll put out um, <clears throat> a vintage 
an older vintage, I mean, a newer vintage, sorry, uh, an older vintage earlier than, sorry, a newer vintage before the older vintage. That's what I'm trying to say. Usually, you know, it's like, you know, as, as the vintages come around, they, they release them. But in this case, I saw the 09 before I saw the 08s. Anyway, so let's check it out. As far as like just the regular Moet, like the Vintage Moet, um, they're on the 12s right now. All right, so I bought this at Total Wine for $149.97. Now I did see the 08 there and I remember it being like a little bit more. Um, so this house was founded in 1743 and it is their Tete de Gouvet. However, you can find, um, you can find other uh, wines that they make like they have the P2 and the P3. Those are stupidly expensive. And they're like, Lenny Kravitz has like a wine. It's like, like around 250, 275 bucks, something like that. The P2 is like almost $500. I don't know what the P3 is, probably even more than that. But those are not considered the Tete de Cuvée, Tete de Cuvée, or the Prestige Cuvée. All right, so, uh, so who's Dom Perignon? He invented champagne, right? Eh, did not invent champagne. Um, so he was, so his name was Pierre, uh, and he was part of the Order of St. Benedict. He was a Benedictine monk, um, and he was born in December of 1639, died 14th of September, 1715, pretty close to my birthday, not the year. Um, <clears throat> and he was a, um, he was a French Benedictine monk who made important contributions to the production and quality of champagne wine in an era when the region's wines were predominantly still red as in still wines in red. Um, so uh, he actually was trying to avoid the re-fermentation or second fermentation. Um, so back in that time, in the 1600s, 1700s, in Champagne, it's so cold there overall, especially down around this time of year, that if the fermentation hadn't finished, then the yeast go dormant. And then in the springtime, like March, April, when things start warming up a little bit, the yeast come back alive or they wake up and they start, they ferment the rest of the sugars. So what happens is you get these, basically these bombs. And so Perignon was trying to figure out how to like fix that because they that was considered a fault. They didn't want to actually have um, champagne. They didn't want sparkling wine, not intentionally. Now there were other places around the world or in France that supposedly were doing it intentionally around this time, uh, Limoux, um, but it wasn't a second fermentation. It was just like one fermentation. But what was happening is they were, they would ferment and they would go, okay, we're done. And they would bottle it. Um, and they would think they were done. So he did introduce a few things though. And a lot of this was in the process of making wine. Um, so let's see here. Um, so he uh, pioneered extensive blending of grapes from multiple vineyards. Um, and then let's see, he, uh, let's see, there's also another set of rules, I guess, that he, they created. And uh, there was in 1718, like three years after he died, um, Canon Godineau published a set of winemaking rules that were said to be established by, by Dom Perignon. So he said, fine wine should only be made with Pinot Noir. Uh, he was not fond of white grapes because of their tendency to enter re-fermentation. I don't think it really matters the color of the grape, but maybe the, maybe the Pinot Noir finished fermentation before Chardonnay did. Um, also aggressively prune vines so that they would grow no higher than three feet and produce a smaller crop. So lower yield type of thing. Uh, harvest should be done in cool, damp conditions such as the early morning with every precaution being taken to ensure that the grapes don't bruise or break. This is stuff we do today. Uh, they like to harvest in the morning or overnight, um, depending on what's going on. So you have the coolness of the day so the grapes don't get hot. And then they use smaller bins so that <clears throat> you don't have the grapes already starting to burst. And then the juice getting, especially with red grapes, getting exposed to... Um, getting exposed to the, uh, uh, the skins type of thing. Um, rotten, overly large grapes were to be thrown out, which makes sense because you don't want rot. And then the overly large grapes, just because they tend to have um, uh, less concentration. 
Uh, Perignon did not allow grapes to be trodden and favored the use of multiple presses to help minimize maceration of the juice with the skins. So that just, so you're trying to do less skin contact. Um, you're trying to make a white wine. So with white grapes, it's not a big deal, but with red grapes, or as they're known actually as black grapes, um, that's the word noir, um, they try to make sure that um, uh, you're not hitting this, that, that, that you're not getting the, um, uh, what you want to call it, the skins touching the juice because that's how you get the color. Um, he was also an advocate, uh, an early advocate of winemaking using only natural processes without the addition of foreign substances. Give me just a second. Okay. I see a reflection on the LCD screen, so I wanna make sure that there wasn't a light on behind me. Um, so I don't know what that is. Oh, you know what that? That's not a reflection. It's the little hand waving at me on the, on the camera saying that the, um, it's um, whatever, the uh, anti-shake or anti-whatever is on. It looked like a, like a reflection. Um, all right, so misconceptions with the myths. So there are myths associated with Dom Perignon. I already mentioned the whole invented champagne. Uh, he supposedly, quote, he was supposedly said, come quickly, I'm tasting the stars. Um, no, that's marketing BS. Uh, the first appearance of that quote appears to have been in a print advertisement in the late 19th century. As a matter of fact, um, Dom Groussard, who uh, basically came along after uh, Godineau, not, and shortly after, it was like I think 1725, uh, he perpetuated the myth that Dom Perignon actually invented the champagne in order to garner historical importance and prestige for the church. Um, it also, uh, this whole myth helped can, uh, commercialize champagne at the turn of the 20th century. Um, so like the champagne people were like, Hey, we had this dude invented champagne. Uh, he was also the first, the myth, there was a myth about him using the fir first to use corks and being able to name the precise vineyard by tasting a single grape likely originated from also Groussard. So, um, what would happen is prior to blending, he would taste the grapes, uh, without knowing the source vineyard to avoid influencing his perceptions. Um, and so this was a blind tasting. So people thought he was actually blind. So when we talk about blind tasting, we mean deductive tasting. Um, and, um, basically what was going on, he was tasting the grapes to just make sure they were good. Um, but he knew the grapes so well, he, he would look like, oh, that came from that vineyard. Um, let's see. He also did, did not introduce blending to champagne, uh, but rather the method of blending the grapes prior to sending them to the press. Um, so, and here's the thing. So the Wikipedia entry for the, for the wine actually has a lot of these myths on it. If you go to the Wikipedia page for Dom Perignon, the monk, it tells you all this stuff. So, okay. <clears throat> um, let's see, I don't know if I said it, but uh, Moet and Chandon was founded in 1743. And uh, so they've been around for a while. So very, uh, they're a very large champagne house. Uh, so is, so is um, Nicholas Fiat. I mean, they're part of a larger group. All right. All right, so completely, not completely, but definitely a different smell than the Palms d'Or. Um, I still get the apple, but there's a little more richness on the nose. Um, it's like a honeysuckle also on it. It's not as lazy or yeasty. It's not as brioche as the Palme d'Or, but it's there. Um, I think croissant is another good description, but it isn't like you heat it up type of thing. It's just kind of more like it, you got, like it's more like a cooled off or room temperature. A little swirl just to activate some things here. You know, you just got a blast of CO2, basically. All right, let's taste it. So similarities with the Palme d'Or, there's, there's definitely an apple. It's a little more green apple than golden apple or caramel apple. Um, it's a lighter, I would say probably more elegant or more maybe a little more refined in its in its mouthfeel. 
um, it's not as it's not as full as as it. Um, it's a little more, I'm gonna say, restrained. Um, yeah, I, I know I should, really shouldn't. Well, I mean, you can swirl your champagne if you want. Who cares? Like this one, I just want to drink. Whereas the Palme d'Or, I want to like sit in my mouth for a little bit more. I just want to like let it roll around in the mouth feel kind of. This one's kind of like, I taste it. I was just like, man, I just want to drink it. Um, it's, it's, it's not that there's a sweetness to it, but it's brute also. And it, um, uh, so we're, we're talking, you know, anywhere from that zero to 12. So, and I have no idea if they're on the closer to 12 or closer to something else uh, as far as, as far as the uh, sugar content, but there's there's definitely a richness to it, but it's super delicious. Um, yeah, the golden, the more of a green apple, um, not quite as much caramel. Um, there's also this little bit of like a, kind of a waxiness to it. It's less bakery, less pastry than the Palme d'Or. Um, it's just like clean and easy to drink and smooth. It's super nice. <clears throat> really like this wine. Yeah, I really can't remember the last time I've had Dom. I know I've had it, but when was the last time I had it? I don't know. Um, and I know the 09 vintage isn't as prestigious as the 08, but it's it's about as good. I mean, literally, it's it's like right there. Um, the 08 just kind of came along and said, hey, I'm the best vintage of the 2000s, and uh, at least over the first decade. And um, 09 came along and was like, oh man, I was pretty good too. Oh, and as far as the blend, it varies between, you know, the Chardonnay Pinot mixture blends from year to year. So um, this feels like it's more Chardonnay-like than Pinot. It may or may not be. I, I don't know if... Oh, yeah. So you get the gift box, and they give you, like, a little story card here. So let's see. I don't think it tells you in here. But let's let's read the, let's read the, the notes about, about the harvest. I mean, about the, the vintage. So the year began with unfavorable conditions that lasted for some time. A harsh winter was followed by a mild and rainy spring. Flowering turned out to be difficult and the threat of mildew was high. Storms in July raised fears for grapes' health. August, however, was perfect. Weather was un uninterrupted, hot and dry, right up to the harvest. With the unfortunate exception of a hailstorm on September 4th in uh, Haute-Villers, uh, Verzenay in uh, Chuli. I may have totally butchered all those. <clears throat> the harvest began on September 12th in idyllic conditions. The fruit was magnificently mature and flawlessly healthy. The Pinot Noir grapes had surprisingly little color. All right. So let's, for why not, let's read their tasting notes, which I did not read. I read the, I read the top part and then I was like, tasting notes, ignore. Notes of guava, and spicy green grapefruit zest combined with stone fruit, white peach, and nectarine. The wine opens up with the whole complemented comp, with the whole complemented by woody vanilla and warm, lightly toasted brioche. Okay, I did get the toasted brioche a little bit. On the palate, that was the nose. On the palate, the fruit is majestic, ripe, and fleshy, and profound beyond the richness and a certain voluptuous is a strong impression of consistency that prevails. The wine's power is remarkably restrained. Okay, I think I kind of mentioned something about that. The various sensations, silky, salty, sappy, bitter, and briny, converge and persist. This was Richard Joffrey, um, 2016, June 2016, so three and a half years ago. So, let's, now that I've read the notes, let's see if power suggestion is going on here.
I can kind of see the guava. Not necessarily grapefruit. I can see the white peach more than nectarine. But um, salty, not really. Silky, yeah, I can see that. I would say bitter and briny, sappy. I would, I would say silky more than anything else, but it's just, it's clean. It's easy to drink. It goes down super smooth. It's nice. All right, moving on. Hold on, let me pull up the app here real quick. Do, 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 do. How you doing? I'm doing outstanding. All right, so <clears throat> we've got mail. No, <laughs> you've got mail. All right, so next up is the Krug Grand Cuvée. Bought this at Specs for $174.07. Um, Total Wine had it for like $165-ish, $167, but they were out of stock on it. They tried to give me the 04. I'm like, no, that's like 350 bucks. No. Um, their other location, well, one of the other locations supposedly had it, but I went to Specs across the street to look for it. And they said, well, our location, you know, that's the next, the closest location actually has it. And so I went there. Now, the only thing about Specs is they have like, if you pay with cash or debit card, um, you get like a little discount. So, because I was spending so much money, I went with credit card on this one. So $174 uh, from Specs. So Krug was founded in 1842 by Joseph Krug from Mainz, not Mainz, Mainz, Germany. So that is the northern part of, uh, uh, that's over in the Rheingau and Rheinhessen area. Anyway, um, and uh, I didn't get the whole history, but he worked at, I forgot where, and then he was like 40 something years old. He was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start my own champagne house. What? I think it was at Boob Clico. I, I don't remember. If I look it up, I'll put it in lower third if I remember to look it up. But he was like 40 or 42 years old. He's like, I'm gonna start my own champagne house. <clears throat> so this quote kind of sums up the philosophy of Krug. Uh, a good house should create only two champagnes of the same quality. Uh, he wrote, Joseph Krug wrote in his notebook, champagne number one, to be the fullest, fullest expression of champagne every single year. And champagne number two, the expression of the circumstances of a particular year captured by Krug and created only in the years where there is an interesting story to tell. Okay, so... The Grand Cuvée is there every year they, they release a wine. So they're, in their opinion, the quality level of this is the equivalent of their vintage champagne. Now, granted, the vintage champagne is way more expensive. But, uh, so it's not a Tête de Cuvée, but in their mind, it's a, uh, it's a, um, an equivalent quality level. So they have an app, and what they do is they have... Um, they have on the back label, they have an ID. So this ID will tell you everything about this wine. So, oh, so every Grand Cuvée has a number. So this is the 165th edition that they've done. So 165 years. And this was not like last year. This is, uh, we're about to find out. Um, this is considered basically the best, depending on the list you're talking about, the best champagne house, okay? No knocking these guys, but this is the big dog. This is why it's the last one. It's the most expensive, and it's not the, not, it's not the vintage, all right? So we're going to... So you have an app. You can either scan the Krug ID or type it in. So we're going to try scan, and I got to... Let's see if it's, yep, it got it. Okay, I think it got it. The Krug ID was not found. Let's try that again. I think it's looking for a QR code. So you can type it in. So there's a number on the back. So let's type this in. All right, so this is a blend of 127 different wines from 14 different years. The youngest wine is from 2009. Uh, the oldest wine is from 1990. The cork 
Cork received autumn. I think it's the, I think it's disgorgement. Is autumn of two thousand sixteen. Um, it's forty seven percent Pinot Noir, thirty eight percent Chardonnay, and fifteen percent Meunier. Remember, they dropped officially. They dropped the Pinot part of Meunier, so it's called Meunier now, not just, not Pinot Meunier. The story of your bottle. Uh, it just says every year we create a, a new the multitude of facets that form each edition of Grand, a Cru Grand Cuvée with its myriad flavors and aromas. Everyone can find something in it that stirs their emotions. Uh, Eric Lebel, who is the Krug Cellar Master. Um, all right, and I'm not going to go in the rest because there's a ratings. I don't know what the Discover More is. Oh, okay. The, this bottle spent at least seven years in Krug Cellars developing its particular expression and elegance, <clears throat> receiving its cork in autumn of 2016. Yeah, it must be the disgorgement date. Um, that's when they they uh, they basically do the massage. They, they get the crown cap off, it disgorges the little um, the yeast, and then they put a cork in there. Um, every year since the foundation of House Krug, a new edition of Krug, Krug Grand Cuvée is created to Offer the full expression of champagne. This bottle belongs to the 165th edition, a blend of 127 wines from 14 different years. We've already talked about that. Every glass poured from it is the fruit from more than fruit of more than 26 years of careful craftsmanship. Let's see. Um, so it, it's it composed around the harvest of 2009. What, what? So I kind of got lucky that I got basically uh, another 2009, kind of. Uh, after a frosty start to the year, we'll see, we'll compare their, their vintage notes. Um, the wonderfully mild spring offered an auspicious beginning to the growing season. From late summer onwards, the vines basked in warm and dry conditions, and the grapes ripened beautifully. When the harvest began, they were in excellent health and showed a perfect level of maturity. From the first tastings, the wines of the year showed remarkable balance. Vibrant Chardonnays from plots in Avise, or Avise, there's no little, there's no uh, accent. Auger, Villers, uh, Marmory, uh, Trepel, uh, elegant Pinot Noirs from plots in, or the Chardonnay, that's where the Chardonnays came from. Um, Pinot Noir came from uh, Verzi, Ambonet, and I, as well as uh, radiant Mouniers from plots in uh, San Gem, I don't know, Gemi, uh, and ba Basue, all brought their unique character to the blend. Let's see here, oh, and the rest looks like actual tasting notes. So let's just get into this. Throw my uh, really good stopper on here. Keep it nice and fresh for Monday. This one's coming to Psalm Group Monday. I'm not sure which one of these I'm bringing to Psalm Group. I also have a party going to tomorrow night. I don't know if I'm bringing any of these or the or the Payard. I mean, I've got four wines to drink. Okay. So it's not as lazy as the others. It's more fruit-driven. But it, it, it's back to the apple again. It's more of a golden apple than a green apple. But you get the brioche. It's like taking this palm door and just taking it to another level. Okay. Get some more CO2 in my nose. Yeah, that just kind of accentuated the, the lazy brioche bakery stuff. There's a toastiness to it, um, almost like a toasted marshmallow. Not quite s'mores, but almost like a toasted marshmallow. Yeah, like now that I'm saying it, I'm now looking for it, looking to see if there's more of it. Oh my God, let's, let's just taste this thing. I have no idea what this thing is rated. 
and I, I never give ratings anymore. And I'm kind of being like dramatic by saying this word, but perfection. It's not 100 point wine by any means. Maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe some of these are 100 point wine. I don't give points anymore, but this wine is just exquisite. It's, hey, let me tell you, I will drink any of these wines with not a problem. But this one is just like, I think what it is is just, it's, it's more my style, right? And, and yes, I know it's Krug and, you know, but I think in a blind, I would pick this wine over the other two. I mean, if I'm going to rank the wines, it would be one, two, three. Even though I really like this Dom, like in certain days, I would rather drink this one than the other two. But right now, in the celebratory mode I'm in, I mean, yeah, so there's a richness again. Riches should be part of the champagne talk. Um, but there's kind of that caramel going on. Uh, golden apple. Toastiness. Toasted marshmallow on the nose more than the palate. And there's really like toastiness on the palate too. It's, it's the breadiness, the toastiness. It's not the marshmallow. Um, I mean, maybe you can make a case for, for a marshmallow, but <clears throat> remember I talked about like the, the croissant that was heated up. So it's kind of like that, but it's, it's more toasted rather than just kind of like warm. Like you put it in the toaster oven for a little bit, just to heat it up and give it an extra little bit of that Maillard, um, quality to it than the palm door but it's got some of this like cleanness of the green apple right it's it's like a best of both it's like he blended these two and got this um man it's it's delicious now <clears throat> was i expecting it to be the best of the three i didn't know i didn't know what to expect um i knew this was gonna be really good i was actually kind of I was kind of pulling for this to be number one of the three, and it was the cheapest of the three. I was like, man, this could, I want this to be number one. Like, because, you know, like, every, Dom is Dom, right? Everyone knows Dom, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't want this to be number three because it's, like, the mass-produced one. This is also mass-produced. And not to say this is mass-produced, but um, it's... I mean, they're, they're, they're all... I, I, if I looked them up, I'll try to remember... I have, I, have, I have a book that will tell me, or should tell me, the production of all three of these. And it should be these exact, maybe not the 165 edition, but the Grand Cuvée, how much is made, how much of vintage is made, and how much of vintage of this is made normally. I might even get the, the actual numbers of the actual vintages of these, throw them down there. But this is not like, you know, a 5,000 case production, okay? None of these are. I mean, we're talking like hundreds of thousands of cases are made of these things, okay? But they're good. They're really good. It's super tasty, man. It's, it's just like delicious. And there actually is a little bit of bitterness to it. It's like a little bitter orange to it. Really kind of cool. Um, I was just kind of checking out alcohol levels real quick. So the Krug is 12. The Perignon is 12 and a half. And the Palme d'Or is 12. So this is not really low alcohol. More like, quote, normal alcohol back in the day. But yeah, and you know what? I don't really get like a sweetness out of it. Like these two, I talked about a little bit of sweetness. This one is like as balanced as you're going to get. Like it could be 12 grams per liter sugar. I have no idea. But it's like, it's still acidic. But I don't feel like there's like sweetness to it. Like I don't feel like I taste the sugar in it. I know it's not Brut Natur. I would love it if it was. But it might actually be unbalanced if it was a Brut Natur. 
So in brute and torque can be like up to two grams or three grams liter of sugar. It's delicious, man. I got nothing else. We're at 44 minutes and 37 seconds on the on the audio recorder here, which means it's probably at 44 minutes on the actual video. Guys, this has been great. So <clears throat> only because it's champagne. Bonk. Let's do the real deal and pour a glass in the flute so we can get the bubbles. Cheers to you. Thank you all for watching. Um, it's been a great year. I think next week will be the recap slash what's in the future episode for Elite Wine. I don't plan on recording. It's, it's December 7th. I don't plan to record anything between now and like the last week of the year. Um, so I can figure out exactly what I want to say. But for right now, being the New Year's Eve episode and episode 500, um, thank you all. It's been a wonderful 10 and a half years at this point. The year's been great. Uh, I got to see a whole bunch of cool stuff this year. And um, that's it. We'll see everyone again next time.